I mean, I had the image of the girl being pulled out of the water in a net, a fishing, fishing net, and uh, the question, who is she? Is she alive or is she dead? You know, often a movie, when I write a film, it often starts with an image like that, you know? And um, like The Crying Game, I had this image of... <laughs> <laughs> you know what image you had? No, no, no. It's an image we'll never forget. <laughs> with a langer. So that's what we, and then no, from no, there... No, <laughs> yeah, a typical, a typical Friday night. No, it's okay, it's okay. But, but uh, in this case, it was a more innocent image of a girl being pulled out of the water. She didn't have a langer originally. No, she didn't. Did you no. think about it at any stage? She didn't even have a tail Selkie in this case. No, no, no. No. <laughs> but uh, she... Uh, so, I mean, I'm, I'm saying, where, where does this go? And will it be a fairy tale? Will it be a real? Will it be a horror story? Will it, I don't know. And in a way, the daughter, Annie, you know, acts as me questioning as I'm writing the script. You know, what is this story? Where is she from? You know, is she... Real? Is she a selkie? Is she a mermaid? You know, she must be one of them, you know, because it's a fairy tale. She must be one of these things. So I followed it like that, and I suppose I wanted to tell a fairy tale that, fairy, sorry, tell a fairy story that was kind of based in reality. You know, that never departed too much from reality and see was it possible. And that led to the whole aesthetic of the movie. You know, there's no effects in it. There's no digital effects. It's just a camera acting and the landscape really. So it's. Um, I mean, I suppose my question was, will an audience? Uh, want to believe so much that in the end they get annoyed at me as a filmmaker, you know what I mean? I don't know. Let's see. It's not been out yet, but, you know. They, well, they, they I, I, I think they will believe it, and uh, much of that belief obviously will come down to the performances. Mm. Um, Colin, if I may say, terrific performance. And, um, Thanks, man. Un understated, and in a way I, I felt it was a sort of coming from the less is more type right. of performance. Is that something that you, you wanted to bring to the role? Was that a conscious decision on your part, the way you play it? Not really. Um, I just, uh, I loved the simplicity of, of or the seeming simplicity of the character of Syracuse. I loved that he had taken all that, that, that had befallen him in life, including, you know, a mother that's recently passed, a daughter that's very sick, um, two years sober as an alcoholic in a very wet town. You know, and he had taken all that on the chin, and and uh, he completely lacked the self pity, which would have been extremely justified if he had felt it. Mm. You know, or this kind of woe is me attitude with the world. He was just getting on with the business of living and being the best father he could day to day. And he kind of starts off the film with his head down. I, I felt doing it that he kind of starts off with his head down, and then through the telling of this story and the imagination of his daughter and and his playing along with it, and obviously the arrival of Dean sparking her imagination and sparking his belief in, in the possibility of fairy tales, his head begins to come up a little bit and he begins to hope again because he's someone okay. that has had so much hardship in his life that he's, he's stopped hoping, you know, he stopped believing that, that in life uh, dreams are possible, you know. So that I, don't think, I don't think there's any false promises in the film, I don't, I mean, who am I to say what the audience will feel or what they'll take from it, but I don't think the script or the film, the way you told the story, gives false promises, I don't. Well, I, I, think, hope, I, I hope not. I no, think it's, no. it, it's hard for me to be objective or, or even to be to watch a film in a subjective way as being in it but it's like it seems to be a match like the audience are, are drawn along as the characters are believing certain things and if the characters beliefs change then it's exposed to the audience maybe their belief changes as well you know yeah so it I, I think it also says that you can't really it's live not a with, trick you can't just live with ordinary reality you know it's too harsh in a way you know yeah and most of us need a kind of a dream or some kind of imagination and it is you know, that imagination that, that rescues Syracuse. What we are. Pardon? It is that imagination that rescues Syracuse. And the end rescues her, I think, in a way. You know, it rescues their story, okay. I think. You know, because uh, they've, he's made this imaginative leap into what she is or what she could be, his daughter has. And in the end, you know, he keeps that imaginative leap going and turns the reality into some kind of mm. fairy tale, you know. Okay. Um, out, outside of your, your own performance, there, a fantastic performance by um, Alison mm. Barry uh, playing. Anna. Yes. Um, Annie. Annie, sorry. Annie, sure, it's okay. Uh, you can, how did you come across her? From, from, what, from what I've read, that she was just in school, she wasn't a trained actress, you, she didn't, it wasn't no, auditioned. I mean, I mean, just how did that come about? Yeah, well, if, if, I mean, Ken Loach once said, if you cast a kid, just go into any school in the north of England and choose the ten best, brightest kids in the class, in the school, okay. you know, you'll find a great performer. That it often is the way with kids. If you you have to just go around and find kids in their ordinary environment, you know, and, you know, see, do any of them have this kind of dramatic propensity that will, you know, turn into performance. And that's what we did. We saw loads of kids and eventually, you know, little Alison Barry turned up and she was absolutely magic. And she had this great advantage of these enormous beautiful mm -hmm. eyes. She Her does. eyes are huge, you know. And she really knows how to use them, actually. I could see as we were doing the movie, 
I could see the eyes kind of mm -hmm. learning all the habits of right. acting. Okay. Well, everything else was, I mean, everything was totally natural anyway, but the eyes kind of led with her, you know. So, I mean, you, you try and get a kid who can be utterly yourself in this rather artificial environment of a film, and if that works, you know, you're, you're home and dry. If it doesn't work, you're dead. You okay. Know? She also injects a lot of humour into the, uh, the film as well. Yeah, I think a lot of humour was written into her part as mm. well, you know. I think. And the environment obviously was one that was about as, as less artificial as an environment can be on a film. Of course, you know, all of us had the benefit of working in, in that real mm. environment, you okay. know, working against the wind, with the wind, the rain. You know, the sea, the splash, the spray. But also you need the generosity of the actors. I mean, the problem with child actors is they can make other actors furious. I remember doing Company of Wolves, and I had somebody who was not as young as Alison, but who was it, David? Um, God. One, of the, one of the rather revered British actors says to me, I hate working beside children because they always destroy your performance. <laughs> <laughs> and you need a bit of generosity yeah. on the part of the thespians, yeah. in a way, you know, to... to allow the child performance to happen. And <laughs> to allow their performance yeah, to be destroyed. Absolutely. And okay. Colin and Alicia actually mm. absolutely gave that, you know right. what I mean? Because nobody can beat, you know, an unaffected performance from a kid who's acting for the first time. Yeah. You know, because nobody can reach that simplicity mm. in a way. And so, you know, and in a, in a way it, go, it goes beyond acting itself, you know, yeah, when well, you are being, touching actually. into they, something. They are being, if yeah. they're working, they, you know, they're being in the, in, the, in, the, in the moment and in the environment and there are no tricks because they haven't learned any tricks. You know? Yeah, that's true. Um, just out, outside uh, or beyond the performances, uh, just two things that were striking <coughs> throughout the film was the, photog the photography, the cinematography, mm. and the, the score. The score? Oh, yeah, great. Yeah. Um, the score yeah. was done by um, uh, Kjartan, Kjartan Svensson, Svensson from Sigur Ross. Sigur Ross yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the photography was Christopher Doyle. Christopher Doyle, yes. Who the... I had heard from, from Psycho. Before the Psycho. Key. Oh, he, he wouldn't be happy with that. Well, maybe yes, he I would know, be. and I know he yeah. was involved in rabbit proof fences. But yeah. is this the first time you had worked with um, uh, either of them? With well, both of well, them? Well, I mean, and the, let's how take, was it? Let's take no. Chris first of all. Chris, Christopher Doyle is a legend because he actually came out of Hong Kong. You know, he's Australian, but he uh, he moved. He did quite a few films in China, and over the last 15, 20 years, the <coughs> most interesting cinema in the entire world has come out of Asia. And Christopher was there at the genesis of all that. You know, he shot some of the greatest, uh, you know, Chinese language movies. And he speaks Mandarin, you know. And uh, he reinvented photography, basically, I think, you know, because he, he returned it to, you know, to the, just what the lens actually photographs on the stock and how to push the stocks and how to actually, you know, kind of, you know, uh, adapt all of his cinematic techniques for the specific films in question. He's done very, very heavily stylized movies. And in this case, I said to him, Chris, how are you going to do this? Because, you know, the great films you've done, like Chungking Express or In the Mood for Love, they're so stylized yeah. and so kind of manicured in a way. Mm -hmm. And he said, look, I choose, I look at each film as a different, you know, as a totally different aesthetic challenge. In this case, he had to do it with no tricks whatsoever, <coughs> almost without any lights, entirely available light and stuff like that, you know. And hold the camera, most of it's handheld. But mm. he had to place himself in the water, you know, with that boat, you know, with mm. Colin, with Alicia, with Alison. Okay, you know, the, in the, the environment. That was his, that's what he did, yeah, yeah. Right. Mm. And, and then, as you say, with, without the tricks, mm. it goes back to what you were saying about the story itself, without the special effects, without the tricks, it, 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 it it retains that simplicity of it all as well, and that, that works on that level as well. Well, I mean, the question is, you know, does the landscape have enough magic itself to tell the story? I think it does. I hope it does. I okay. hope the audience will feel the same. I think it does, yeah. Um, yeah. And Svensson, if we could just finish. Oh, yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Sigur Ross, sorry, they're one of, sorry, Sigur Ross, they're one of the most interesting musical events of the last <coughs> years, anyone who's seen them. You know, I decided to put one of their songs right at the centre of the film. You know, the plot hinges mm, on that. It's actually pivotal right to the role then, yes. It's a very well-known song. It was a song by Madonna. You'd look like a right idiot, wouldn't you, if you're not having recognized it. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, and Kjartan did a beautiful score, extraordinary score, you know. I mean, the thing is, if you get a rock and roll being to write for a movie, they tend not to know the kind of uh, rhythmic changes and dynamic changes that film scores need. So you tend to get, you get something absolutely beautiful, but it can exist, you know, on one plane a bit, you know what I mean? Which I had a, quite a lot of work to do with a lot of what Kjartan wrote. You know, some, some things he wrote for some scenes, I changed it and put it in another scene. So there was a lot of that back and forward process, but I think the end result is marvelous. It I does, do. it works. 